Well, good evening. Welcome to our Wednesday evening study here at Church of the Resurrection. This evening we'll be looking at the Westminster Confession of Faith, chapter 27. If you don't have a copy of the handout, they're right up here for you. Before we start looking at this chapter of the Confession, let's go to the Lord in prayer and let's ask his blessing upon our time this evening together. Please pray with me. Almighty God, we pause at the beginning of this study to recognize, remember that you are our God and that we are your children and that you have been so good to us, so kind to us, so gracious to us, that throughout history you have promised your son, the seed of the woman, and that came to fruition in your son Jesus. We ask that you would help us to see him a bit clearer tonight, that we would understand the gospel just a bit more and that we would come to know you just a bit more and that you would fill us with your spirit Let your spirit descend on this place. Fill us now, we pray, for your glory, for your sake, that your kingdom would be expanded and grown and that your people would be edified. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Well, this evening, as I mentioned, we're looking at chapter 27 of the Confession. It's a chapter on the sacraments, not any particular sacrament. As we'll see, there are particular sacraments, but this is a a whole chapter dedicated to what is a sacrament, and it's fitting. There's kind of a logic that we move from the last chapter, chapter 26, on the communion of saints, as you'll recall a few weeks back, to the topic of sacraments. What we have here before us in chapter 27 is a a general statement about sacraments, and then in chapter 28 and 29, respectively, we will look at baptism and the Lord's Supper. Spoiler alert, those are the sacraments. This chapter begins with a general definition of what a sacrament is. Is so That's how, how we begin in um, section one here. It begins with these words. Sacraments are holy signs and seals of the covenant of grace. Let's pause right there. If you have a copy of scripture, turn with me to Romans chapter four. Um, if you don't have one with you, there should be one in the seat back pocket in front of you or perhaps behind you. Romans chapter four. As we see here, the confession starts out with Sacraments are holy signs and seals of the covenant of grace. And and we see here in Romans chapter 4 this language being used in verses 11 and 12 by Paul as he is talking about Abraham. In verse 11 it says this, He received the sign of circumcision as a seal of the righteousness that he had by faith while he was still uncircumcised. The purpose was to make him the father of all who believed without being circumcised so that the righteousness would be counted to them as well. And then verse 12, and to make them, excuse me, to make him the father of the circumcised who are not merely circumcised, but who also walk in the footsteps of the faith that our father Abraham had before he was circumcised. So, so we see here, This language being used of a sign and a seal. Again, look back at the beginning of verse 11. He received the sign of circumcision as a seal of the righteousness that he had by faith. So the sacraments are a sign. That's the first thing we learn about what a sacrament is. That is, they are a sign that that points beyond themselves to something greater, to something else. Think For example, if you have ever driven down I-17 down into Phoenix, um, before you get to Phoenix, you will see signs that say Phoenix, right? You see a sign that says Phoenix, just um, as you see it, you see, oh, there's a sign that lets you know that Phoenix is just up ahead. It lets you know what is coming. A sign is not The thing itself, it is a real thing, but it's something that points beyond itself to something greater, something bigger, something fuller. When you see the sign that says Phoenix up ahead, you know instinctively that the sign is not Phoenix. So so when you're driving down the freeway and you see a sign that says Phoenix, nobody goes, oh, I'm in Phoenix, I guess I shouldn't say nobody. We had a friend one time who was driving across country and he was going from, I think it was Boston to Jackson, Mississippi. And he is convinced to this day that he went through Grand Rapids, Michigan to get to Jackson, Mississippi. Now, maybe he did and he just went the really long way. But what I 
pretend a thing might be the case as he saw a sign that said Grand Rapids, Michigan, and he, not knowing very well exactly where he was, thought that he was in Grand Rapids. But, but most of us, when we see a sign that as we're going down the freeway that says Phoenix 37 or whatever it is, we know, oh, that sign is not Phoenix. We are not in Phoenix, but we are, we are near Phoenix, and the sign is telling us we are 37 miles away from Phoenix. You know that the sign is pointing forward to Phoenix, but it is not Phoenix itself. And, and that is what the, the confession is here using about a sacrament. The sacrament is a sign. It's pointing to something else. It is not the thing itself. It's not what it's, what it's um, declared to be in Scripture all the time, and we'll see exactly how it relates to that here in a moment. But it's pointing to some bigger reality, to some greater reality. Also, the sacraments are a seal. A seal is something placed on a document. Think perhaps of maybe like your birth certificate. It might have a seal on it or your driver's license. If you pull out your driver's license, now they have kind of, you kind of can do this and you can see a little like holographic logo or, or seal on your driver's license that lets you know that the thing that you have, it's, it's authentic. It's, it's the real thing. It can be trusted when you hand your driver's license to somebody and they, they kind of do that special light to see those seals. They're checking to see, is this authentic? Is this real? And that's what they're doing there. And, and here we have the um, sacraments are not only a sign point to something else, they're a seal saying that, that, that what is being sealed is, is the real thing. It's genuine, it's trustworthy, it's authentic. These sacraments point forward to and guarantee the covenant of grace. That's what the confession says here. It says they are, they are holy signs and seals of the covenant of grace. Now, those who have been here a while, you may remember all the way back to when we were looking at chapter 7 of the confession where it dealt with the concept of covenant. I don't have the time here to kind of rehearse all of that, but if you remember in short... That section pointed out that the scriptures lay out God's dealing with humanity through successive covenants. These covenants began in the garden with Adam before the fall, what the confession called the covenant of works. And then after the fall, God initiated a covenant with Adam. We see the promise of that in Genesis 3.15. In Genesis, where the promise of the seed of the woman is going to come and crush the head of the seed of the serpent. That's the promise of this covenant made after the fall. That was the beginning of the covenant of grace and all subsequent covenants, the covenant with Noah and Abraham and David and, and so on. God made these covenants with his people. These were different administrations of a single overarching covenant the confession argued, and we showed from Scripture that that is the case, that these are all one overarching covenant called the covenant of grace, with the final administration of that covenant being brought about and being consummated with Jesus in the new covenant. So in other words, God works in history, what we might call he works in redemptive history, and the way he works in history can be traced through these various administrations of the covenant of grace. And here it says that the sacraments are signs and seals of that covenant. So when the confession says that the sacraments are signs and seals of the covenant of grace, it is saying that they are signs and seals of the gospel because the covenant of grace really is the unfolding in history of the gospel. Or we could say that the sacraments are signs and seals of the salvation that we have from God, including all of the parts of salvation, things like justification, adoption, sanctification, glorification, etc. The sacraments point to and guarantee the authenticity of these wonderful blessings of God. And as you have your Bibles in front of you, turn back with me to Genesis chapter 17, and we can see this being um, used again, not in the new covenant, but with the covenant God made with Abraham, Genesis chapter 17, verse 11, it says this, you shall be circumcised in the flesh of your foreskin and it shall be a sign 
of the covenant between me and you. So, so when God made a covenant here with Abraham, he provided a sign for that covenant, a, a sacrament for that covenant that would remind, would point to the covenant that he had between him and God. And then it goes on here in section one to say, they were directly instituted by God. So the sacraments are things that God himself has instituted. We, in other words, do not get to make them up. We don't get to kind of pick and choose what we want sacraments to be. It's not up to us what the sacraments are. We do not get to say, well, maybe we'll make this or that a sacrament. No, they are instituted by God because they are part of the promises, the covenants that God makes. They are something that God blesses the church with. And for those who know church history or are familiar with other traditions, you may know the Roman Catholic Church has seven different sacraments, baptism, confirmation, um, what they call the Eucharist, what we would call the Lord's Supper, reconciliation, anointing of the sick, marriage, and holy orders. So they, they have some other sacraments as we will, we will look here in a moment because there are only two that we think are in scripture. These seven sacraments are not instituted by God. Well, at least five of them are not instituted by God. And instead were things that the Roman Catholic Church added throughout church history either by popes or various councils. And even during the Reformation, there were times Luther, for example, he at one point thought marriage was a sacrament and then later he changed his mind on that. So there's been some kind of debates throughout history, even in Protestantism about this. And we'll see some other churches today that would kind of fall under the broad banner of Protestants that have some different sacraments as well. But we see here that sacraments need to be given directly by God that confirm the, the um, covenants that he has made. So that's what the confession goes on to say. And then it says that these sacraments are to represent Christ and his benefits and to confirm our relationship with him. As we noted earlier, the sacraments represent Christ, um, his, his person and work. We said that, that they represent the gospel. They are signs of the covenant of grace, covenants um, that's, that's the gospel there. When we see the sacraments, we are seeing a representation of the gospel. Not only do they represent Christ, not only do the sacraments represent Christ, but they also confirm our relationship with Christ, with God through Christ. That is to say the sacraments are a means of our assurance that we belong to Christ. So if you doubt that you are saved, if you doubt that you are in a right relationship with God, one of the ways that God has given to you to help tell you, you are my child, is the sacraments. These are one of the ways that he has given to us. He says, if you doubt that you are saved, look to the sacraments, look to your baptism, look to the Lord's supper. God has given us these sacraments as means to grow our assurance, to, to grow our trust and faith that we do, in fact, belong to God. More on assurance, if you'd like, on chapter 18 of the confession. We looked at that a number of weeks back as well. They are also intended, it goes on to say, they are also intended to make a visible distinction between those who belong to the church and the rest of the world. So the sacraments are also a visible representation that distinguish the church from those in the world. The sacraments are, are a thing that you can see that set the church, the visible church. As you recall, a few chapters back, we looked at the distinction between the visible church and the invisible church. And here, when it says church, it's intending here the visible church, the church that you can see. What, what, what's one way that they are demarcated from the world? Well, baptism. Well, the Lord's Supper. They are things that we can see that distinguish the church from the world. And then it says, and solemnly to bind Christians to the service of God in Christ according to his word. Turn back with me to Romans, if you will, Romans chapter 6 this time. And we'll see this, this idea that, that in baptism we are, we are called to service to God, that we are called to, to fight against sin in our baptism. We are called to fight and to be aligned with Christ. You see in 
Romans chapter 6, beginning at verse 3. Romans chapter 6, 3. Do you not know that all, all, all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? So when you were baptized, you were baptized into his death. That baptism symbolizes, pointed forward to, seals his death. Then it goes on to say, we were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. So, so why was this sign given? Why were we baptized? So that we could walk in newness of life, so that, that we could be sanctified, that we could be glorified, that we could be resurrected from the dead, that we could fight this world, that we could be in allegiance and bound towards God through baptism. Any questions on section one of the confession here? We have kind of a definition of what a sacrament is. All right, we can go on if you want to come back. That's fine. Section two here is sometimes referred to as the sacramental principle. It addresses what the word is means. When Jesus said, this is my body, in, for example, Luke chapter 22, verse 19, what does that is mean in that statement? This is my body. In what sense is the bread his body. And this was a big dividing point um, during the Protestant Reformation. There was a, a time where many of the Protestants got together and tried to come up with a confession of faith to try to unify the Protestant Reformation. And, and this one point was sticking. Um, in fact, it's um, alleged that Luther took out a knife and carved into the table that they were sitting around, ec corpus meum, which is the Latin for this is my body. Because um, he was really big on this is my body. And we won't go into all the intricacies of the Lutheran understanding, but we will look here at what the Reformed or, or Presbyterian understanding of it is. And here's what section two says here with the sacramental principle. In every sacrament, there is a spiritual relationship or a sacramental union between the visible sign and the reality signified by it. And so it happens that the names and effects of the one are attributed to the other. So this is the sacramental principle. It is here to help us understand how a sacrament relates to the thing that it represents. So, for example, in the Lord's Supper, we have the bread, right? And Jesus says, this bread is my body. But, but as we know that the bread remains bread, it doesn't turn into tissue and nerves and bones and vessels. We can pray over the bread. We, we do, in fact, we consecrate it. We use it in the Lord's Supper, but it still remains bread. Whatever it was before we have the Lord's Supper, it's still that. Or put more abstractly, you can refer to one thing as something else when it has a sacramental relationship. So Jesus can take this bread because it has a sacramental relationship to the new covenant, to the work that he is going to be doing, because um, it's, you know, when he gives that, it's, it's the cross is still out in the future. And he says, this is my body, because there is a sacramental union, a relationship between the thing and the thing that it is signifying, but between the bread and the cross, his body being um, nailed to that cross for our sins. So we can refer to the bread sacramentally as the body of Christ. The bread has a sacramental union or relationship with the body of Christ such that it is possible to call one the other thing. This view is in stark opposition to the Roman Catholic position that argues that the bread actually becomes the body of Christ not in the way that it appears or tastes or feels, but, but in its essential properties, in its essence, what it actually is, it becomes the body of Christ. And they make this argument by relying on some Aristotelian philosophy that I will not bore you with this evening. You're welcome. But that's what they use to try to say it looks like bread, it tastes like bread, it feels like bread, but actually it's not. It's actually the blood and body of Christ. And they, they 
use that from Solosi. But, but it's important to note that the confession here is denying this understanding of the sacraments. Also, it's important to recognize that the confession is also denying that there is no relationship whatsoever between the physical sacrament and the thing it represents. So there, there are some today who would argue that the sacraments are nothing more than an aid to help us remember. This is sometimes called the, the strict memorial view, that, that all we are doing, all the sacraments do, is help us remember what is going on. Remember what happened back on the cross. And say, no, no, there's, there's something more than that. There is a connection. There is a union. There is a spiritual, a sacramental union between these two things. They argue that there is no essential connection, some do, between the two things. But here the sacraments are being said that, that there is a connection between the two. And, and this view is being denied that says there's no connection whatsoever between them. Or think about what Jesus says when he institutes the Lord's Supper. He, he takes up the cup, what we think is the third cup perhaps of the Passover meal. And he calls the cup, this is the cup of the new covenant this cup is so related to the new covenant, to, to the covenant of grace, by way of its sacramental union, by, by this principle here, that it represents the gospel and all the benefits of Jesus, that it can be called the cup of the new covenant. This is the cup of the new covenant. Any questions on section two? Yeah, go ahead. Correct. Yeah, um, we get to that here in a moment about the exact nature of how the two um, relate. This is saying that they relate, and then we'll talk about how, but yes, definitely, it's the Holy Spirit that does it. Yeah, it's not mysticism or something like that. Yeah, correct. Good question. Yeah. Uh, I'm just struck by the idea of the, um, it talks about the covenant of grace. Uh, it doesn't specify the new covenant uh, in section one. But just thinking about how uh, how uh, the sacraments of the ancient Hebrew people uh, would help shed light on what Jesus said, this is my body. Um, were there things that were signified by, for instance, the Passover lamb? Can we, can we pause this Tell yeah. question section 5? Okay. Section 5 deals exactly with what you're talking about explicitly. Okay. All right. So if after 5, if you still have a more comment or question there, let me know and we'll come back to it. But I think um, section 5 of this is going to hit right on the head exactly what you're talking about. Okay, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. So then we have section 3. This section deals with the efficacy or the effectiveness of the sacraments. It says, it begins here with, the grace which is exhibited in and by the sacraments. So let's, let's stop there. That there's grace that is exhibited or shown or demonstrated or set forth by the sacraments. This, this is the grace of God here seen in the new covenant, seen in the covenant of grace being unfolded. We have here that the sacraments exhibit or show or demonstrate this grace. They do not work to use a Latin phrase, ex opera operato, which is the, the way that the Roman Catholics view the sacraments, which is Latin for from the work performed or, or in the working it works, something like that. That is to say that the, the um, sacraments here, the grace of the new covenant that is shown here is not conveyed simply by performing the sacraments, all right? The, the grace which is in them is exhibited in them. It's, it's shown in them, but it is, it is not necessarily bestowed through them, necessarily. It, it may be, but, but it, it may also not be. It goes on to say, rightly used, it not, um, yeah, excuse me, rightly used is not conferred by any power in them. So, so when the sacraments are rightly used, there's nothing in them or in themselves that does this. The sacraments themselves do not contain any power in and of themselves. This kind of goes back to what you were saying a moment ago, and we'll see here in a moment exactly, okay, so how, do, how does the effect come about? 
They have power only insofar as God deems them to be effective and to have means of grace. And it goes on to say, neither does the efficacy of a sacrament depend on the piety or intentions of him who administers it. So the effectiveness of the sacrament does not depend on the the holiness or the intentionality of the minister that is administering them. I should, um, that that, that should come to all of you as kind of a, a sigh of relief when you go, oh, that's good. It doesn't depend on our pastor's holiness. That's, that's really good, right, that, that it doesn't do that. It, it brings me relief. It brings me comfort knowing that it doesn't depend on my holiness because you may have a different view of me than I do, but I know my lack of holiness, right? So when, when we are doing baptism and, and the Lord's Supper, it doesn't depend on my holiness here and what I intend to have happen um, when we do this. But, but God is working in and through and despite <laughs> my lack of holiness or the lack of holiness of some other minister. So then what does it rely on? Well, it says here, but rather on the work of the Spirit, capital S, Spirit, Holy Spirit. So so what makes it effectual? The Holy Spirit. Why, Why is it that the sacraments can convey grace? Because of the Holy Spirit. And it depends on the words of institution, which contains, together with a Perspective authorizing its use, a promise of benefits to worthy receivers. So, in other words, the efficacy, the effectiveness of the sacraments depends on the work of the Holy Spirit and on the words of institution. Let's look at the second part first. What does it mean here by these words of institution? What the confession is getting at here is that as long as the sacrament is done as a sacrament... Right? So just going to the, the pool with the pastor and getting wet is not a baptism. Why? Because there were no words of institution. There, there wasn't the intent there to, for it to be baptism. There wasn't the words pronounced from Scripture that this is baptism. That needs to be there for it to be actual baptism. Right? That's what it's saying here. That is the proper words from Scripture are used to indicate that this is in fact a sacrament then it is a sacrament regardless of who is performing it. So Jesus says, go therefore and baptize in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, right? So that needs to be present for it to be Christian baptism. If if that wasn't part of your baptism, then whatever it was, it wasn't Christian baptism. And as we have said, dealing with the first part of this um, phrase, the effectiveness of the sacrament depends upon the work of God through the Holy Spirit, empowering them as effective means that we receive by faith from God. So, so that's what makes them effective, is God says these are going to be effective when and how he so chooses. Any questions on section three? Yeah. Yeah. That's part of the words of institution. Yes. If you're asking me, must it be fenced for it to be communion? I probably would say no, but that is part of what we're doing when we're fencing. For those who don't know what fencing the table is, it's fancy language for for when we give communion, we verbally put up some kind of protective barriers around the Lord's Supper so people know who this is intended for and who this is not intended for. Right? The Lord's Supper is intended for believers, and we'll say believers who are in good standing of a Bible-believing church. Right? They, they are a member of a church. They have been communed by some Bible-believing church, and if they've been communed, then they can come and partake. That's what we mean by fencing the table. And when we do that, that is part of the words of institution, but I wouldn't go so far as to say that they have to be there. Maybe I got a bunch of hands. Maybe they're going to tell me I'm wrong on that. Yeah. Correct. For I receive what I pass on to you. Yes, that's definitely the words of institution. Yeah, what Paul says in 1 Corinthians when he says, For what I passed on to you, from what I received from the Lord, that on the night in which he was betrayed, he took bread, and he took the cup. And, and when he says those things, those are, those are the words of institution. Yeah, we're yes. From the Correct. Yeah, I, I, when I do it, I happen to do the, the 1 Corinthians passage. Yeah. 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 
Yeah, so the, um, the question is being asked about Roman Catholic baptism. I intentionally didn't bring that up, so thank you for bringing that up. I really appreciate that. Um, but now that it's out on the table, let's deal with it. Um, so first I will say this is a debated issue within Reformed theology, and, and, and I believe it was even debated by the divines, such that you can see one part seems to suggest this, another part seems to suggest that, and I would almost venture to say that's intentional for them to do that. Um, then the natural question is going to be raised, so I'll just raise it now before you raise your hand. Well, what do you think about that, right? And it honestly depends on what day of the week you ask me. Um, I, I, I am like 50... 1%, 49% on this issue back and forth. Um, we had someone who was wanting to become a member here that asked that question, and I, I thankfully said, well, let's talk to the session and see what they think and kind of put that on, on us as a, as a whole to think through it. And then for some other reasons, that individual ended up not, not pursuing membership, so we didn't actually have to deal with it. Um, so I don't know. There, there are good reasons, I think, when people say we ought not to receive Roman Catholic baptism, particularly that at the Council of Trent, they anathematized the gospel. Um, that's a big deal for um, a church as a whole to do that. Um, but at the same time, they use the words of institution properly. I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. They have the same conception of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit that we do. It's the same doctrine of God, doctrine of Christ that, that's being used there in their minds. Um, they use water. Thank you. Yep, yep. There's water involved, which is necessary for um, the sacrament. The amount of water, as we'll see, is not necessary, but that's a We'll punt that to next class. But, but yeah, so, so I don't know is the, an, is the long answer. When I was at seminary, I was much harder in the no camp that it does not count. And as I've gotten older in my old age, I've become soft in my old age and I've become squishy, um, some might argue. So, but but, I, I, but I, don't, I, I don't know. So um, today, I would probably say yes if you asked me today. But then ask me in two weeks, and I'll be like, oh, no way. Did you hear what the Pope just said, right? And then I get all, like, angry about things and stuff. So I, I don't know. But it's a good question, and it's one that they dealt with um, for sure. And, 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 in fact, a lot of the um, Protestants, probably not at the time of this was written, but, but a lot of the Reformers, their baptism was a Roman Catholic baptism because that was all that there was. Um, so that was a real real big question for them to deal with and wrestle with and there's tons of literature on that and I can point you to some more of it if you really are interested in that because my wishy-washy answer has not given you a satisfying response I'm sorry yeah uh, the part about the, the sacrament not depending on the piety of the person administering it wasn't new at all right when they did this go back to like the, the Donatist controversy century. yeah 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 the piety of the person goes all back to the Donatist controversy Oh, this is really racking my brain here for church history, but I think it was having to do with the fact that there were, there were um, um, people who were baptizing that ended up leaving the faith. They, um, when persecution came, they, they apostatized. I see a couple heads shaking, yes, like I'm on at least the, the right track, right? And then people that got baptized by them were like freaking out, like, whoa, what does that do for my baptism? The person that baptized me is now bowing down to Caesar or whatever the case may be. And there was a controversy about this called the Donatist controversy. And I believe, wasn't it Augustine who was the one who argued vehemently against the Donatists saying, no, the baptism doesn't depend on them, it depends on God, um, which is ultimately what the confession is here saying, yeah. Yeah, so it didn't, it didn't arise at the time of the, of the Reformation, this question. It was way before that. But it had radical implications during that time, yeah. Good, section four. What are the sacraments of the new covenant? That's what we're looking at here. There are only two sacraments ordained by Christ our Lord in the gospel. So what um, this is saying that is in the new covenant, there are only two sacraments. There were um, other sacraments from other covenants in the Bible. We'll look at that here in a moment, such as circumcision and the covenant made with Abraham, as we saw back in Genesis 17. But in the new covenant... Under the gospel, there are, um, and, and the final covenant, the final administration of the covenant, there are only two sacraments. And there's no suspense here. We've talked about it all night. It's these two are baptism and the Lord's Supper. There are only two sacraments in the new covenant. Marriage is not a sacrament. Penance is not a sacrament. There are some groups today that argue that foot washing should be a sacrament. It's not a sacrament um, of the church because... 
as we saw earlier, they need to be instituted directly by God as a sacrament, not just something that Christ did or something that God did or approves of, but, but that it's actually part of the sacrament and it needs to be connected with a covenant that's going on there. Neither sacrament may be administered by any person except a minister of the word lawfully ordained. You might ask me, okay, pastor, where does the Bible say that? Where does the Bible say that that baptism can only be given by a minister lawfully ordained? Or where does it say that they can only give the Lord's Supper? And if I'm honest with you and I want to be, there's not. There's not a Bible verse I can go to that says right here says you have to be an ordained minister to do that. So since that's the case, what, why is it? that the confession includes this? Why is it they say that it needs to be done by somebody who is lawfully ordained? Well, the reason the confession adds this phrase is because they rightly believed that the sacraments should be accompanied with and by the proclamation of God's word. So that when the sacraments are done, God's word must be proclaimed. God's word must be involved in it. This is one of the reasons why we don't do private communions in our homes by ourselves, right? If there are people who can't make it to church, the elders will go to them and give them communion, but we will have a service in their house. We will invite people to come. Who wants to come? Let's go to so-and-so's house, and we will give a proclamation of God's word. We will have, maybe it might be a, a mini service. It might not be the, you know, the full hour and a half service that you might get here on the Lord's Day, but, but we will go there, and we will, we will pray. God's word will be read. It will be explained, and then the sacraments will be given. So, so they're, they're, they're rightly seeing a connection here between the proclamation of God's word and the sacraments. That's why they include that here. Since the sacrament points to the covenant of grace, so too they should be accompanied by a proclamation of the covenant of grace, a proclamation of the gospel, because that's what they're pointing towards. It, it would be kind of like me standing at the sign down on I-17 that says Phoenix and me just pointing at it and smiling, right? No, I want to tell you, you know, this sign is telling you about Phoenix. Have you been there? It is awesome. It's a great city. It's got all these wonderful things. It's got food. It's got culture. It's got baseball teams or whatever else you love about them. Saguaro cactuses, the heat. That may be a positive or a minus depending on your perspective. But, but right, we don't just sit there and look at the sign. We want to talk about, well, what is it pointing to, right? So that's, that's what we do with the sacraments here. What what we do not want to have happen is the sacraments to be administered and to be partaken of as some sort of superstition. Right? They're trying to avoid some superstition that, that you, know, you, you have to take this. And, and sometimes some traditions will you know, even force feed it to people out of some sort of, of idea that, that that's got to be done. Um, that, there's, that there's specific something going on here. In order to help safeguard against the sacrament being done out of superstition... The confession says that it must be done by an ordained minister, by a lawfully ordained minister. So it's to safeguard against superstition. Any questions on section four on the sacraments? Ryan looks like he's got a question brewing. Oh, not, not really. I mean, you probably would. Yeah, that's a good question. I, I'm not 100% sure that I would do that. Um, you know, like I, I have a friend, a, a dear friend, who is not on all the same theological pages that I am, and he looks for every opportunity to baptize his own kids. He's, a minister, he's not a minister. He's just a, not even a, an elder in his church, just a lay leader in his church. And they will often invite us to their baptism ceremonies at their hot tub in, in their house. And it's got to be a hot tub because they have different views on the modes of baptism, you see. But, but I'm not sure that I would say that because it wasn't by an ordained minister that therefore that, that child is not baptized. I think that goes back to the previous section about the holiness of the person who's doing it. It's, it's, that's not the important part 
of it. I think that's generally how it should be done. If somebody asks me, um, you know, what do you think of, of me doing this? I would say, yeah, I, I would advise against doing that. I would have an ordained minister do that. But I don't think that I would necessarily advocate that if you were not baptized by an ordained minister, then you have to get rebaptized. Because, for example, I think, I think, I'm not 100% sure on this, I know I was baptized as an infant in the United Methodist Church. I think it was by a female minister. I don't know that for a fact. But if I found out that it was, would we have to say, well, because we don't recognize female ordination and minister, they weren't a lawfully ordained minister, then do I need to get rebaptized? And I think we would look back at the previous part and say, well, no, we would say it's irregular. It's not ideal. It's, um, you know, not, not the way that we would want to have it done. Um, we, would, we would teach against why we want to have it done this way. But I, at the end of the day, I wouldn't want to say that. Because I mean, we see examples in the Bible of non-ordained ministers doing baptisms. So I think that there's wisdom in saying we should have it that way. But I don't think we can insist on it and then go so far as to say, well, if it wasn't, then it must be done again. At least that's where I'm at on that. Yeah. Yeah, and, and I want to agree with everything you just said with adding the caveat that that doesn't mean every single thing that calls itself a baptism ought to be considered a baptism. So there are some groups who would say you should only get baptized in the name of Jesus, um, for example. And we would want to say, no, that was not a Christian baptism. Um, we wouldn't call it rebaptizing them because they weren't baptized to begin with. They had something that happened to them with water and, and perhaps an ordained minister, but, but it wasn't baptism because for it to be baptism, it must be done in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit in the Trinitarian framework, a Trinitarian understanding and context. Because even some groups would use the, the name, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, thinking here of the LDS church. But they would have radically different understandings of who they are, and we would say, yeah, we, we would want to rebaptize, or I don't like the word rebaptize, we'd want to baptize that person the first time because that was not a baptism, right? So I want to agree, and with everything you're saying, yes, but then we also want to say, but there are instances where we would say that, that somebody has not properly been baptized, even though they think they may have been. All right, section five. With regard to the spiritual realities signified and exhibited, the sacraments of the Old Testament were essentially the same as those of the New Testament. Let me read that again. With regard to the spiritual realities, so, so what they are pointing towards, what they signify, and what they exhibit, the sacraments of the Old Testament were essentially the same as those of the New Testament. So the Old Testament, as we've mentioned already, had sacraments. In other words, what the confession is pointing out is that the Old Testament sacraments, particularly thinking of circumcision and the Passover, they were pointing forward to the same realities as baptism and the Lord's Supper are pointing towards because they were pointing to the same covenant the covenant of grace. They, they were different administrations of that covenant, but they were all pointing forward to one and the same covenant. Circumstan circumcision pointed forward to the circumcision of the heart made by Christ in regeneration. And Passover pointed forward to the wrath of God being passed over his people through the sacrificial death of his son. And as we have pointed out a number of times, what the confession is safeguarding against here is the notion that there are two different ways of salvation, that there are two different things that these sacraments are pointing to, that in the old covenant they had a different reality they were pointing to, and in the new covenant we have a different reality. It's saying no, that is not 
the case. One um, on the Old Covenant and one in the New Covenant are the same realities. Here it is making it clear that the Old Testament sacraments and the New Testament sacraments points to the same realities. They both point to the gospel of Jesus, ultimately. Paul makes this ex, um, connection explicit in Colossians chapter 2. So if you have your Bibles, turn with me to Colossians chapter 2, and we'll um, look at this as the last part of our section here, Colossians chapter 2. We see here in verses 11 and 12, this exact connection between the Old Testament sacra um, sacrament of circumcision pointing forward in the New Covenant. In verse 11, it says, In him also you were circumcised with a circumcision made without hands by putting off the body of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. So, so the circumcision in the Old Testament pointed forward to a circumcision that would be made without hands, not one done to you physically, but, but one that is the circumcision of Christ, verse 12, having been buried with him in baptism. So how is it that you get this new circumcision? Well, it talks about it being signed and sealed in baptism in which you were also raised with him through faith in the powerful working of God who raised him from the dead. So, so circumcision and baptism are both pointing to the same reality, the circumcision of Christ, the circumcision made without hands, the, the new heart, the being reborn, being born again, having a circumcised heart as the Bible talks about elsewhere. Any questions on section five? Did I get to what you wanted to get to with that, DH? Okay, good. Yeah, seeing nothing on five, well, we'll just simply conclude with then, I think the first kind of statement of the whole section kind of summarizes what, we're all, what this is all about. Sacraments are holy signs and seals of the covenant of grace. So when we go forward and look at um, baptism and we look at the Lord's Supper, we are looking at signs and seals of the covenant of grace, things that point us towards the covenant of grace, things that assure to us, they, they give authentication of the covenant of grace. And that's what we have here in the chapter on sacraments. Now, one concluding thought, if we were writing a confession today, I'm not sure that we would need an entire chapter on what a sacrament is. We would probably just have a chapter on baptism and a chapter on the Lord's Supper, but, but at this time, that was very heated discussion with the Roman Catholic Church. They actually had an entire chapter on just what exactly is a sacrament before we look at the two particular sacraments. So we'll conclude with that, and then we'll transition to a time of prayer.